Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our 2020 Northeast Local Enterprise Partnership AGM. So I'm going to say it's lovely to see so many familiar um, faces, and that is because some of us are closeted away in a secret destination in the Northeast. I'm here with uh, the LEP uh, senior executive team, all laterally flow tested and uh, and so on. But we are very pleased to be in the room together, uh, sharing updates with you, our audience, and um, welcome to you all out there. We have over 300 people who've registered to join us this morning, so thank you. Uh, thank you for your interest in the work of the Local Enterprise Partnership and your support for all our work. Uh, I think when we did this online last year, no one quite anticipated that we would still be, many of us, still working from home or in different circumstances, but we have weathered through in the last year. And what we're going to hear this morning is some of those achievements, some of the challenges that have been overcome in the last year. So there is lots to celebrate. We have really overcome many challenges in the Northeast and everybody here, and, and when I say here, I mean you at home, have played your part. The Local Enterprise Partnership is exactly that. It's a partnership working together. So thank you. Um, housekeeping, um, I don't need to tell you about fire exits and we've already covered that here in the room so we know what we're doing. We are going to finish very promptly at 10.30 um, so I'll bring things to an end there and we're going to hear from Helen Golightly and other colleagues from our senior executive team, hear a bit about the money, uh, what we've achieved and perhaps some future plans but particularly we will be taking your questions, some of which are already beginning to come in so thank you for that, we'll, we'll feed those and many of you will be familiar that the way to do that is to go on to www.slido and that slido is sli.do but it is there on the screen now I hope in front of you www.slido or use the hashtag or and use the hashtag more and better jobs and you can post your question you can tick for someone else's if you like the look of that uh, but we'll try and field as many questions as we can in the short time available to us. Um, just a few more words from me. We have achieved a great deal this year. Some of the things we've achieved, um, we've played a part five, six years ago, and we're hearing great big announcements about bright, shiny new buildings now, but an enormous amount of the legwork happened five, six, seven years ago, clearing land, not very exciting, not very sexy, but vitally important for things like IAMP to get the wonderful investment that it got last year, or to access routes for British Volt or other big developments in, in Durham uh, around Net Park and so on. So not all of it is about bright, shiny buildings. A lot of it is doing the work behind the scenes in partnership. And similarly, not just buildings, we have a very positive story to tell about skills and innovation, which we'll hear about. Business growth, of course, absolutely essential to us and innovation where we have particular strengths in the northeast so we'll hear a little bit um, from my colleagues on the executive team about all of those areas um, it's been a great year it's been a busy year there is one thing I want to say and that is how pleased we all were in the northeast LEP community when our chief exec Helen Golightly was awarded her OBE in the Queen's Honours last summer for her contribution to business and the regional economy and Helen who is a very modest woman would say that is a reflection on the work of the team and the partners all around but we've we've celebrated that in a appropriate uh, form of celebrations this year so I think that from me just for the moment and let me hand over to our chief executive Helen Golightly thank you So good morning everybody um, and welcome and thanks, thank you Lucy. What I want to do is obviously this is our annual general meeting so I want to basically just update what we've done over the last year through 2021 but before I do that I just want to sort of give a little bit of depth and breadth around what we're, what we're actually about as an organisation. I know as, as Lucy said there's about 300 people online viewing and we just there's a lot of new names as they came through there's some of our old friends sitting out there and you'll know who you are but there's a lot of new names so we're going to try and keep this quite high level. I'm going to canter through in the next 15 minutes or so um, a lot of information but we will make the slides available to you at the end as well so so going back to I suppose what is the local enterprise partnership and what is our role for the region 
Um, so I think that the key thing is around where the organisation that leads and sets the regional economic strategy, clearly with partners, with many of you out there who we've worked with over the years, but we do this in a very evidence-led research way. Um, so we, we provide that economic leadership, we work with um, local authorities, the combined authorities, businesses, ports, the airports, the universities, colleges and so on and so on um, in order to bring all of that information together to try and really understand what's happening out there and what do we need to do to set the economic policy for the region and then we'll lead that delivery and we work with partners to facilitate and make sure and work together and see how we can um, make those priorities happen. We really try to secure um, and prioritise um, investment funds so we'll try and secure as much funding as we can for the region and I know I'll cover that in a minute but my colleague Paul Woods will cover that as well in his presentation that follows um, and my colleagues who you, you'll meet very shortly on the panel um, lead and facilitate the delivery of those programs which I'll come to in a second but the key thing for us is we really want to work with you our partners to make a difference in the northeast so, so what do I mean by the strategic economic plan? So this is our umbrella document. This is what drives us going forward. So it's a plan from 14 to 24. Many of you, many of you will know that. So we set out to create 100,000 more jobs in that 10 year period and 70% of those jobs to be better jobs. And by better jobs, we mean man managerial, technical and professional jobs. As you can see from the, the chart, um, we were doing really well to, up to two years ago. The strategy was working. We were at about 76,000 jobs, um, more jobs within that period. We've had a lot of challenges, as Lucy referred to earlier, with coming out of Europe, with the pandemic and so forth. And that level of jobs is, has dropped. So we're really working at the moment to try and understand what we need to change, if anything, in terms of our policy. But I think what we learned before that is what we were doing was working and we need to just keep on track and we'll get back to the position hopefully we were two years ago. So that's our key targets. And how, we, how do we do this? So very, 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 very quickly, the strategic economic plan. So we really try to focus on where's going to be the greatest benefit, which, which are the grow, real growth areas as we see them in the, in, the, in the local economy. So as you can see, very, very quickly, and I'm not going to go into any depth on any of these, we can read more about it on our website. We focus particularly on digital or tech, um, advanced manufacturing, but particularly vehicles, pharmaceuticals, health and life sciences and energy, um, particularly obviously green energy, offshore renewal and so forth. And then we focus on supporting or enabling sectors, education, finance, professional business services, transport and logistics, construction. And then throughout all of those, there's the whole focus on digital transformation, which as we know, and we've seen absolutely clearly over the last two years while we've been in the pandemic, how critical the di digital world is to us and how that's going to prove um, and be really innovative as we move forward. But going back to delivery, what we do is we focus on five programmes and each of my colleagues sitting with me here today f basically lead one of those programmes. The first one is around business growth, which also looks at sector development. So those key sectors, what do we need to do within those as well? Around innovation, how do we can make a difference and move, move research and, and commercialisation of that research forward um, and work together to be much more innovative? skills um, but right across the board from cradle to grave um, it's not just about skills within the workforce it's about preparing the workforce of it for the future in terms of working through a lot with our schools and colleges and so forth transport connectivity and lastly which is the program i also lead within the within the lep is investment and infrastructure so looking back over 2021, I'm going to give you a quick flavour, and as I say, going back to that depth and breadth, so I'm going to fly through these, um, but hopefully we can answer questions going a little bit more depth on the panel. So what did we actually do with the delivery of those programmes within 2021? Firstly, on investment in infrastructure. Um, 
We basically manage four funds, and I'm not going to go into any detail about this because Paul, my colleague, is going to pick this up. But we manage about £850 million, pound, or have managed that over the last few years. So we've secured that money for the region. That in itself has levered in at least um, two times as much in terms of direct investment, so quite a substantial investment into the region. Particularly this year, we've, we've invested 26, millions, 26 million in some regional projects. And going back to what Lucy said earlier, we've focused very much on getting sites ready and in a lot of that investment. So we've prepared sites that, sent, that have enabled the, some investments that we've heard about this year. So JDR Cables and, and British Vault at Blythe, Envision at the IAM, Just Eat in Sunderland and the Amazon development at Follinsby and Gateshead are all sites that we've worked with partners and local authorities to get away and get those incredible investments into the region creating those jobs which are so fundamental to our our plan we're also preparing other projects coming forward so we've invested or are investing four million pounds in in projects right across the region to develop those business cases and looking to see how we can invest the commercial property invest in the commercial property world as we invest and in, um, launch another fund in a few weeks time on business and sector growth, you'll see um, a photo of some, of some of the team. This is our Growth Hub team, which has doubled in size, which we've needed to do to cope with the challenges over the last two years. And some of them are on this photo, not all of them. Um, they provide one-to-one -one advice and have done um, over the last year to nearly 25,000 businesses with very, very focused amount, again, to, of support for 720 of those. That has boosted the, the economy incredibly. We've also invested in regional recovery. Um, we look at how can we really understand what's happening in businesses and we report that to, to government literally every week. What's the intelligence? What's the insight? To hope that government will take forward what we're saying in terms of what's happening out there, what's the feeling of businesses, what are the current challenges and so forth. So we also have a dedicated team or teams focused on those key um, sectors, so energy and so forth as well. Going on to skills, um, we manage a number of programs. Um, picked out a couple here, um, Opportunity Northeast, Northeast Ambition and Education Challenge. Collectively, they are looking to see how we can influence the careers guidance and get every school, that's every school in the Northeast, um, to abide by the eight careers benchmarks, but also working with the leadership teams within schools to get to a point where every school in the region is good or outstanding. We've also um, completed this year a pilot study on careers education in primary education, as we know um, a lot of those decisions in terms of future careers sadly are made so early in life at the age of five, six, seven, when some subjects are starting to be ruled out by some of our young, young um, people in schools. We've also helped to, de to design the national T levels um, with DFE and working closely with government on the implementation of that. Um, Michelle, who you'll, you'll hear from um, in a little while, has also um, given evidence at the House of Lords Youth Employment Select Committee this year, um, which we were very proud to be chosen as a LEP to do that. We work with SEND learners and really trying to home in and give some specialised support in terms of their destinations and have run a pilot study around that as well as the over 50s. So we're working right across the, the spectrum of skills, really trying to make sure the skills are fit, fit for the labour market as we move forward. And we've also proudly this year, and it was is coming shortly and you'll hear more about it, is looked at the National Careers Week and secured that for in, in the North East, which is the first time outside of London this year. Moving quickly on to innovation, um, Alan and the team and the innovation team has launched what we're calling innovation delivery partnership pilots. So this is where we've, we're really homing in on some of those niche areas within those sectors, trying to get them work to, working together, learning from each other, be innovative together to move the economy forward. We've also focused on um, a number of projects that we're calling our innovation projects and looking at that pipeline. How can we get those motivated, get those developed and implemented?
We've secured £320,000 from Community Renewal Fund, um, recently announced in the budget from government, for a Future Markets Acceleration Programme, which sounds very grand, but it's really trying to understand what are the businesses of the future and where, where are they going and how can we really try and accelerate those into delivery to create those jobs in the North East. And we're also in the process of trying to secure um, from colleagues in the North of Tyne, um, I think it's going to a meeting later today, over £700,000 pounds for an innovation challenge program as well as working with our partners across the northern powerhouse on a wide wider program that covers the north around innovation on transport connectivity that's clearly not um delivered by the North East LEP itself, but we work incredibly close with colleagues in our Transport North East team um, who lead all of, all of the transport um, parts of the delivery of the strategic economic plan. This year we've seen the, the public, pub, public, publication of the North East Transport Plan, which has a huge pipeline of projects and investment and really articulates where we really need, need to take that transport connectivity forward over the foreseeable future. Future. The team have continued to deliver the Trans Transforming Cities programme and a couple of pro uh, projects named on there, Sunderland Station and Durham Bus Station be, be only two of a number of projects that's been delivered. The team are continuing, continuing to deliver the Metro Acid Renewal Plan um, through 2023 and we're waiting to understand what their future funding from government looks like to continue doing that. The team have worked very hard to um, submit a bus service services improvement plan again that's with what that's with government at the moment as well we've implemented um, a lot of work around really encouraging cycling and walk, walking um, really trying to get that green agenda highlighted across the region through a couple of campaigns over the summer last year on go smarter and the go active campaign and I suppose bottom line, and I suppose that it, it is on the bottom line of the slide, but it's absolutely fundamental to moving forward and we continue collectively across the North East to lobby government to invest in plans to maximise capacity on the, north, on the East Coast main line and to get that train line moon, moving effectively is af absolutely fundamental as the rest of the country um, profits from HS2. And then more broadly, just on the last slide from me, um, other street strategic work we do and regional projects. So apart from those five programmes that are absolutely fundamental to the strategic economic plan, we obviously continue looking at that plan, making sure it's current and visible for the whole region. And we're looking at that at the moment to see how, as we come out of the pandemic, that needs to be tweaked and focused and so forth. And you'll hear more about that over the next few months as well. Um, that is absolutely underpinned by an evidence base and how we inform decisions and how we inform what that plan absolutely looks like. Then we've undertaken region-wide projects, um, some things that have been particularly in the news this year. We submitted a North East Freeport bid um, back in um, January or February in 21. Unfortunately, we were unsuccessful in that bid, although it did score very highly in go with government. We also um, are working right across the region on the net zero and trying to coordinate and, collect and bring together all of the region's net zero activities, which, which is quite a task in itself and making progress with partners. We've done a piece of work on export and trade and published um, very, very recently, just before Christmas, um, a publication, a plan known as Global North East and driving growth in the North East, but very, very lucky and look at working with um, DIT, our colleagues in government, as well as the Chamber of Commerce locally um, to really understand how we can take that agenda forward again especially as when we come out of Europe. Um, we've continued to um, coordinate and collaborate across a number of projects across the region as we come out of Europe. Also on the levelling up agenda, what does that mean? How can we all work together to really get the bank, best bang for the book for the North East? We're looking at internationalisation. How can we position the North East on that global, scale, or on that global stage and continue um, to put the region out there as well as working on projects across the northern powerhouse and put the north on the map globally as well. 
And finally, from me, um, before I move on to 2022, very quickly, is just to let you know that, and that we have undertaken an extensive piece of work um, on looking at and evaluating the strategic economic plan. Because for me, it's not just about identifying what we need to do and really making sure that we deliver that, but it's about making sure that we're actually going to make an impact and what we're doing and what we're saying is the right thing. All of these, all of the things we have refer referred to today are on our website and there's more information, but obviously you know where we are. We're happy to pick up a conversation with anybody on any of, this, any of the things I've sort of quickly and canted, canted through today. And then very, very quickly, looking forward through 2022, well, there's lots of question marks for us, I think. So we obviously, as I've said throughout this short presentation, we will continue to lead and deliver the strategic economic plan, but also looking forward to what comes after that plan in 2024, um, which isn't that far away now. So we're ready and poised to take the region forward beyond that as well. But the critical thing for us and, and many of our, our, our people um, and partners out there who will be watching today is really waiting to see what that levelling up white paper is going to say and what does that mean um, in terms of government policy, but not just in policy, in terms, in terms of potential funding that it will bring and how can we bid and get that funding into the North East. We're also um, looking forward to interpreting and delivering on the skills for jobs white paper, which was published late last year, as well as the innovation strategy. We're keen to learn more from government as our partners around what the UK Shared Prosperity Fund looks like in terms of quantum focus and direction. The enterprise strategy, um, which is obviously being developed by colleagues in Bayes and across government. And then critically for the team on a much more operational basis, there's a national LEP review. So our government are looking at LEPs across the country and the model of the 38 LEPs and trying to understand whether they need to change going forward. So we're keen to understand what that looks like and what the transition looks like for ourselves in certain how we can work with partners going forward. So I'm just going to pause there and I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Paul Woods, who's going to take you through the finance act aspects for our annual general meeting. Thank Thank you. Thank you, Helen. That's a great summary of activity that we've had so far this year. What I'm going to take you through now is a quick summary of the investment funding that the LEP's been responsible for delivering over the last year or two. Um, and if I just click on the next slide, you see that our main programmes are the Local Growth Fund, with £270 million being spent over the last six years. Our enterprise zone program with infrastructure investment, 157 million. We're halfway through that. The Northeast Investment Fund, which is a local loans fund, 57 million plus of funding. Lots been happening this year. I'll tell you about that in a minute. And our getting building fund, we were successful in getting 50, 47 million pounds of government grant in June 2020, uh, and effectively had to spend that all by the end of March this year. So. This year has been a really busy year and we're looking forward to great success in achieving all of that spend. We managed to add to that some local funding. So we have in fact, a program of just over 50 million pounds. Then a final few words about the LEPS revenue budget, uh, 7.9 million pounds in the current year. And a lot more detail of that is on the LEP website because the paper is going to the LEP board this Thursday. So just focusing on the local growth fund uh, in terms of the grant that we've received. Um, we had a six year program, which is now fully spent in terms of the grant from government, but we managed to get some funding recycled within that. And we're now spending the final elements of that. Um, we've been able to spend around about 30 million in the current year. And we still have some funding, which we're carrying over uh, into next year. And some of the projects that we funded have delivered some savings. And so we will be able to achieve some additional allocations potentially in the order of about £800,000, which will be determined by the LEP board in May. So some final decisions to be taken about the use uh, of the Local Growth Fund grant. You can see a picture on the right hand side, which is one of the construction projects down in Durham uh, at Akeley Heads. And I'll show more about that on, a, on the next slide. But that funding itself, the £250 million, obviously is levered in lots of additional funding. Uh, and so we're talking about an investment of over £670 million, which has made a significant difference across all seven local authority areas uh, in the northeast. 
our Enterprise Zone programme. Uh, we're halfway through the programme of investment in our 21 Enterprise Zones. Again, these are located in all seven local authority areas across the country. Um, by the end of March, we will effectively have spent around about £74 million, which is almost half the programme. Uh, and what we've seen is some great success in some of the infrastructure on the sites, delivering buildings, delivering uh, users and creating jobs uh, across the region. Um, what you can see in terms of the picture there is the development on the Jade Enterprise Zone in Durham, where speculative development supported by the council and the developer uh, has created a first phase of development, which is now fully led. Uh, we're now working on the second phase plans which we hope to be approved in the course of the next few months. So some great progress made there. We've had great progress in Gateshead on the Follingsby site, where the big Amazon development has opened up last year, creating the business rate income that allows us to fund the works that are carried out on the enterprise zone sites. We are planning to generate substantial income from these sites over the course of their 25 year life. We're looking at income potentially of up to 378 million pounds, according to our latest estimates. And that once we've paid off the borrowing costs of the infrastructure, should generate a substantial surplus of over 139 million pounds. We are seeing surpluses that are generating uh, so far, uh, and we're on course in the current year to deliver an additional surplus of a million pounds above our original estimate for the year. That's given us the confidence to be able to invest some of that surplus in other things, quite important things. Uh, we are supporting the LEPS budget potentially up to half a million pounds a year. But importantly, importantly over the last year, we've allocated 3.3 million pounds to a new budget for accelerating development of projects uh, and are in the process of approving 19 projects so far with some of them being reported to the LEP board uh, on Thursday. Uh, a bit more about the Accelerated Development Fund on a separate slide. So, Accelerated Development Funding. It was identified that we really did need to move on some of our key projects in the region with some seed funding to enable the development to occur. Uh, last year, we agreed to find £4 million from local funding. I'm pleased to say that we've been able to approve 19 projects ranging in value from £24,500 individually to up to £150,000. £1.842 million has been allocated so far, uh, and the results of that should be able to enable these projects to move forward at a faster pace. But we're also supporting projects which will deliver and support bids for additional funding. In the last month, our investment board has approved a number of projects which have been reported to the LEP board. So, for example, we're investing in the Northeast Battery Alliance scheme, which is about supporting research and development into new battery technology in the region. Uh, we're looking at heat networks. So green energy has been a really important theme of the funding that we brought to play. Uh, looking forward to the future. Northern Renewable Energy Centre for Excellence is being funded as well, uh, as is uh, North Shields Fish Key. Um, each of the local authority areas has a number of schemes that are being funded uh, from this accelerated development funding source. The NEF itself is a, a local fund, which we're recycling using for a range of different loans. It's been in existence for six or seven years. All 57 million has been initially invested. Most of that money is now being repaid and we're reinvesting it in new loans. I'm actually uh, standing in a building here, uh, the Crown Plaza Hotel, which was one of the recipients of an early loan uh, from the NEF, which has been repaid uh, ahead of schedule. Um, this year, we focused on trying to develop uh, commercial property funds being funded from the Northeast uh, Fund itself in the course of the current year. We've allocated £10 million uh, to boost our, an existing fund for small scale housing developments and commercial property developments, that's going extraordinarily well. We've also been creating a new commercial property investment fund, a 35 million loans fund for commercial property, supported by some additional uh, incentive funding as well. We're in the final stages of appointing uh, a fund manager for that uh, project and expect to launch it 
uh, in April. So significant investment over the next 15 years. We expect that 35 million to perhaps be reinvested three or four times over that period. So creating substantial investment for the future. Turning now to the LEPS annual revenue budget. There is a detailed report going to the LEP board uh, on Thursday. So you can see a lot more information about the budget. The budget for the current year is 7.9 million pounds. And you can see the details set out in the table on the screen. Um, the employee budget itself, 3.74 million. And then there's other funding coming in to actually support the operational activity, particularly around skills, uh, around business development, business growth, a whole range of projects in there which are part of the LEPS revenue budget. This time last year, when we reported on the budget for the LEP, we were talking about a budget for the current year of only 5.4 million. So the final outturn is an additional 44%. And one of the reasons for that is there's often a lot of uncertainty about the funding that the LEP receives from one year to the next. And LEP and colleagues here have to manage that uncertainty, uh, but do a great job in terms of A, keeping the budget uh, and B, delivering the activity in the year when funding becomes available. The LEP just received some core funding from council contributions from each of the seven councils. We received government core funding of about half a million pounds, still to be confirmed for next year. So there's still a little bit of uncertainty that needs to be resolved. But we get other external grants and interest, which the LEP was often bidding for, uh, seven million pounds in the current year. You'll see in our LEP budget, there's only over 26 lines which describe those funding streams and grants. So it's a very complex budget uh, to manage and operate, but I think it's shown the success of the LEP in being able to secure that budget because of the good performance and delivery around skills and business support in previous years. If we look to the budget for next year, again, that budget is down potentially to around about 5.4, 5.5 million pounds, because of the uncertainty of funding. Hopefully over the course of the next few months, as government announcements are made, as funding announcements are made, and as the LEP continues to be successful in its bidding for funding, we'll see that budget grow above the base budget of 5.4 million pounds. That's being reported uh, to the LEP board on Thursday. So that's it in terms of a funding roundup, uh, back to the panel. So thank you very much. Paul, thank you very much. Um, let me introduce the rest of the panel. So Helen, you have met, and to her left, Paul, you've just heard from. Uh, and then we welcome Colin Bell, our Business and Sector Growth Director. Next to Colin is Michelle Rainbow, Skills Director. Next along, Richard Baker, Strategy and Policy Director. And then at the end of our row, Alan Welby, our Innovation Director. So I'm going to, if you think I'm sort of wandering over my eyesight in that direction, it's because I've got half an eye on the questions coming in and trying to feel them. And I realise, of course, that when I welcomed you all, I said, welcome to the 2020 AGM. It is indeed 2022. And perhaps the two years means, you know, the last two years I've been stuck in the time warp <laughs> at home. Maybe I was thinking about the last actual event uh, we had in 2020, but maybe I was thinking about the last two years and how we are still talking today about some of the things we began worrying about two years ago. And one of them is the issue of devolution, um, which we were talking about a lot in 2020, continue to ask questions about, and I'm gonna to turn to Helen in a minute um, for some reflections on that. And of course, now we hear more about leveling up. And as Helen said in her introduction, do we really know what leveling up means? So let me kick off Helen with you, if I may, um, with a brief update, if there is uh, a brief update to be had about regional development and about the um, uh, much hailed leveling up white paper. Thanks, thanks, Lucy. So I think the first thing to say about devolution is that the LEP has always been and continues to be really supportive of devolution into the region. And, it, you know, it's very, very important to be able to make local decisions where we're much more familiar with what we need in the region. So I think that's absolutely critical and we will support our political colleagues as much as we can to take that agenda forward. Um, and I know um, colleagues are talking to government at the moment around how they can potentially um, get more devolution on the back of the white paper that is due to come out 
now in terms of levelling up. As I said in the in the obviously uh, presentation, the levelling up white paper is due out um, maybe next week, maybe the week after. Um, we'll see what government do, um, and we're keen to understand that, but and also to understand what the levelling up agenda is to, is about. But we had a had a meeting with some government officials yesterday. Um, we're expecting it out but we don't really know and we haven't had any ins real insight in terms of what the content says. Helen, thank you. And if I may just stick with you and, and picking up um, our discussions that we've had with, with government, looking at the questions, it's very clear that the, the, the most questions are coming through about the dip in the economy in the North East, um, regional issues at the moment and um, what government support and what our position is with government. Can you say a little bit about the local position um, and our relationship with government? I can, I can do. So, so I think, as, as I said, in terms of sort of employment um, and the statistics over the last um, few months, particularly the uh, figures that came out um, last week, we can see obviously a further um, rise in unemployment um, and a drop in um, the uh, active inactivity rates as, as well in so what we're what we're seeing basically is that there's less people in the labor market which obviously the the statistics showed i think the critical thing for me and, and people who know me it, this this is this is about people it's about families it's about the the need and, and about getting a job about being economically active and the ability to do that and i think people need to just focus in on that it's it, it's it's about real real things to real people and I think this is why we take our job so seriously in terms of really trying to get that policy right. So I think before the pandemic and before we came out of Europe, the, tra the trajectory on the SEP was, was definitely the right trajectory. Um, and I think we, you know, we, we really believe that that is still the case. But we need to work with government to really, you know, translate that levelling up agenda into the North East. Um, in terms of, of particularly funding and help in, around some of the policy areas. Helen, thank you. I'll turn, if I may, please, to you, Colin, uh, and just picking up that theme that Helen's just talked about, about the challenges facing business. Can you just share with us your experience of the, the challenges facing our North East businesses and what the LEP's doing to support them? Yeah, I, I mean, I think generally the challenges facing businesses at the moment that fall broadly into two two areas the first one's um all around cost and finance um we've got a situation at the at the moment where through the pandemic a lot of businesses have taken on debt so in, debt's in, increased and so more businesses are highly geared that's affecting their ability to raise working capital and growth capital to to fund their to fund their recovery but also uh, alongside that we've got the a situation where we've got rising costs so there's inflationary pressure um you know skills shortages um supply chain issues that are all kind of really really feeding into into that so what what can we do to help uh, around those fi financial issues well number one is them um, through our growth hub connector team and um, they can work with businesses to look at their business model other opportunities to reduce costs that may be through operational practices it may be through renegotiating supplier arrangements a whole range of different things but but they'll kind of you know look at that on a on a case by case by case basis the other thing that they do um focus on with businesses is looking at the business model and is there a way of um i, I suppose ad addressing um cash flow challenges within that so c can cash be brought forward can they increase the cash conversion cycle and all those sort of things they'll work with businesses to try and address so there's kind of proper hands-on hands-on support to try and address those financial issues there's also the issue about accessing finance and again the connectors will work with businesses to identify sources of um either working or working or growth growth capital and that may be through vehicles that we've got you know lucky to have in the region like the north the northeast fund the other the other issue that kind of is related is all around skills you know most businesses and most sectors that we're working with at the moment you know, one of the things that they'll they'll say to us is that they're having an issue either recruiting, retaining, or developing skills within their within their business. So, again, our growth of connectors will work with um, companies to devise ways in in which they can look at attracting um, attracting and retaining employees. So, how can they be more attractive to to in, to potential employees and 
and other partnerships across the region with education that, that can really support that. And then we're really lucky through um, Michelle and the skills team that we've got some real kind of really good um, hands-on support through the Education Development Trust where they can go into businesses and really work with them to develop a skills plan. So lots of really good kind of hands-on support we can with, we're, we're there to provide businesses. Thank you. And Michelle, the heads up, I'll come to you in just a minute because it is so important that we hear about um, the work that you lead in your team. Uh, and Alan, in a minute, uh, also, I'm going to come to you about the future look and what markets look like. But we are getting a number of questions about specific issues in the Northeast uh, and the subject very dear to my heart, culture and tourism. And well, uh, the question really I can summarise, will future economic strategies expand to cover tourism and culture? Without a doubt, these have been the most impacted. So maybe um, it might be a double act, I suspect, between Helen and Richard to respond to that. I'll, I'll pick on you first, Helen, because you're sitting next to me. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I, sh I should have said that in the presentation. There's obviously been, uh, we, we've focused up to now on, on key sectors, as I've described, but absolutely, even, even sort of, before, we might not have been as explicit in the economic plan, but we've certainly invested in a number of sort of tourism and cultural um, pro uh, projects, you know, and I, I could name a few for it, Bishop, Guy and Bishop Auckland, for example, um, and a number of others. I think ab absolutely around, it's now a point of looking at which are the sectors that have been hardest hit, and it's not just culture and tourism, but there are also other sectors around hospitality and retail and so forth, and really trying to understand what is what is needed to get those, those um, sectors really, really mobilised and where we can help. So absolutely, yes, there will be. Rich, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I can do, Lucy. I mean, one of the things we've been doing over the last couple of years is working with the tourism sector to understand what the opportunities would have been under the local industrial strategy to, to drive a tourism uh, sector deal response, a tourism action zone. There was that opportunity in the local industrial strategy. So we have actually got a, a significant piece of work which has identified opportunities to improve the productivity and the employment in, in what is uh, a large and growing part of the region economy. Uh, that opportunity hasn't been available, but what has happened over the last year or so has been that government have reviewed the structure of, the, of our destination management organisations, and we've worked closely with all of the DMOs across the region to look at how we can create a, a, a strategic architecture, strategic infrastructure for, to support tourism in the region. And we got a very strong response from the, the, the lead of the review um, in the last year or so. So we're very hopeful. Uh, we're working with the DMOs to encourage government to implement that review. Uh, and I think that will create, create an opportunity for us to drive forward the plan that we created in the first place through the tourism sector deal. Thank you. And I think for me, this is also another great example of, of the partnership piece. We know that there are some great organisations out there working around supporting culture and tourism. And for me, that's part of the successful inward investment story. If a business is going to relocate or locate for the first time in the in the northeast, they want a great place for their for the staff and their families to work as well. So that whole cultural bit that we have up here I think is incredibly uh, important and we do work with some some great partners out there and there's a huge success story to be told at the moment about inward investment thanks to the work um, of, of you guys and our partners I do want to turn back to skills um, because so many questions do come back to that Michelle um, a lot of the theme and the questions coming up are what you think are the priority what is the priority in terms of tackling skills supply and demand mismatches so a few words on that, please. Um, <clears throat> that, that, that's a, a very large part of the day job, as you can imagine. Um, and there are a number of things that we're doing. We want to tackle um, that in the short, uh, medium and longer term. So that involves working with our um, partners with a, a, a national remit, so DWP and Job Centre Plus, uh, supporting those people who are out of work getting back into work ensuring that they have the skills to be able to do that. In the medium term, um, it, it, it's about understanding what our businesses are telling us are likely to be the kind of emerging skills or the emerging gaps that, that they, 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 they think are, uh, they're, they're forecasting. And working in particular with our providers 
to uh, think about the courses that they put on, think about the qualifications that are going to be available, how we adapt things like T-levels, how uh, apprenticeship programmes work in terms of that medium supply. And in, in the longer term, it's about working within our education system so that our younger, uh, younger audience are um, equipped and able to identify opportunities that are going to be available to them you know, in the longer term, so that they understand the labour market in, 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 in whatever term that is and, and are prepared to um, uh, experience the world of work, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I think one thing that I would say, though, is that we, over the last two years, we've seen tremendous strides in terms of the use of digital technology. You know, it's been a necessity when it comes to um, a lot of our business is continuing, a lot of the working from home, and we've seen some tremendous stuff happening. However, what it has uh, shown is that we have a bit of a divide. And digital exclusion is something that has definitely, it's always been there, but it's definitely been exacerbated over the last two years, and it's something we need to address. So ensuring that people have access to the right kit, understand what skills they need in terms of how they move forward into a job and business and that is very different to the kind of social aspect of using digital technology um, ensuring that they have um, access to connectivity uh, and that they are empowered with the confidence to be able to use use um, uh, digital means you know they can access uh, online applications often um, those applications are, are, are done virtually so I would say that addressing that digital divide at the moment is a key priority. My view is that I would like to see uh, digital skills being um, mandatory in schools. Every young person should understand how that, how that is going to impact on their working life. If there are schemes that are happening on a national basis, getting people back into work, digital should feature in that because from what I um, see, hear, read, every business is, 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 is using digital technology in some way, shape or form, and not least it enhances or can enhance your life. You know, um, you, 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 you know, if you need a bus pass, you get it online, if, you know, those sort of things. So to me, that is a key thing that we need to address. And we know at the moment that the Northeast is tailing in that, it is lagging behind. So for me, if we're truly going to look at the levelling up white paper, digital inclusion is a really important thing that we need to address. Thanks, Michelle. If we think about um, the skills for the future, my thoughts turn to the businesses of the future um, and what market opportunities there are for the Northeast. The kind of businesses um, that we are working with now, we probably hadn't even heard of 20 years ago and some of the sectors um, that have really grown in the Northeast 40 years ago, absolutely not in our thinking at all. So Alan, I know you're doing some work on future markets and, and what yeah. might be out there. So can you just share um, where, where your yeah. work is at the moment? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I would say this because I work in innovation. I think um, looking to the future and what the f our future economy is vital because it's fundamental to our competitiveness. Um, if we can't compete, if our businesses can't compete, we can't sell, then our future will be always lagging behind. And we can't have that. We've got to make a step change. And Colin talked earlier about the problems businesses are facing right now, and they're very real. And sometimes when you're in that environment, it's really difficult to look ahead and see where you go. Um, but I think I think we do. Um, I mean, there are some clear opportunities which have had a lot of press recently. So um, you can you can see the transformation of of how automotive sectors is, is happening, the, the move towards electric vehicles, so the announcements around brick vault, et cetera, so, which we'll, we are well positioned for. I think similarly, all the, the discussions around um, climate change and COP20 um, uh, and, and the future provision of, of energy, we are well positioned for. But I think actually um, below the surface here, we we have a number of sectors and markets which actually we, we are well positioned for, which we may not be uh, addressing or, or telling the world about what well, we need to do that. I think particularly space, I can see a real um, uh, emerging cluster um, and a lot of good work um, across the region. Um, subsea robotics building on um, capability we, we, ha we have in that, in that space. Um, I think, um, you know, in our fintech community is really growing payment processing um, areas. We've just um, 
finishing a, a major piece of work, Lucy, around um, looking at those future markets. What are the hotspots? And we've, we've had an external um, piece of work with consultants and, and government looking at where do we think our future hotspots will be in, in the Northeast? And that will be coming um, online over the next couple of months. And we'll have a, a large scale engagement process with people. And, and that I think will be vital for our providers to understand what our future markets will be, for businesses to give them competitive advantage. And for us to think, right, where are our priorities? What are the interventions we need to make to get us ahead of the game? How can we put ourselves ahead of Birmingham? You know, how can we get ourselves on par with San Francisco? How can we get ourselves um, alongside Milan in, in some of our areas. And I think that will require some focus. Just a heads up to the panel, I'm going to turn to transport in a minute. So start thinking about that. But Alan, just to carry on that theme for a minute or two. Um, it's easy, I think, when we talk about skills to think about the work that we do with, with schools and the current workforce. But you've touched on some interesting um, stories there about what is emerging space, um, some, some quite radical things. Can you just um, talk a little bit about the LEPS work with universities and their place in skills and innovation. Uh, universities are so important to this region. They anchor organisations, they employ um, a lot of people. You know, the University of Northumbria and Durham can't move and go anywhere else. They're here and it's great. They are, they are they're central to, to what makes this place a, a vibrant place. But they're also central, I think, to the future of our economy. And I talked about competitiveness and where do we get competitive advantage? We get it through our knowledge to understand the future and apply that into a commercial environment. And um, now universities don't have the, the monopoly on that, but actually I think they play a vital uh, component part of helping our businesses um, compete. So, so uh, you know, all the work they do in terms of actually actually activity. I, I'd also engage here with with catapult centres as well. You know, Auric, uh, CPI. Um, but alongside that knowledge provision, access to finance is vital. If we if we if businesses can't get money to to, to bring forward their innovative ideas, they're not going to grow. If they can't get the right people, they'll have to move elsewhere. So. You know, universities are fundamental, uh, right at the centre of that. So let me turn back to then um, transport, because to get to schools, universities, business, shops, our homes, we need great transport. And obviously, um, we've had a few uh, what I regard as body blows in the northeast about um, a lack of investment uh, in the latest announcement of funding from government in the northeast. So future uh, investment in transport, uh, for me, is vitally important. I'm probably going to pick on, on you, Helen, and then maybe Richard, just to say a few words about um, how important that transport story is and what can we do? Um, well, well, as you say, say Lucy, transport is absolutely fundamental. So, and it, it is, is, it's such a broad topic, isn't it? it? It's about public transport. So it's about keeping the metro going, keeping, keeping buses going, etc. It's about roads, it's about rail, it's about connectivity within the region and out to other, other areas and getting people into the region. And it's not just about people, it's about goods and logistics and getting all of those you know deliveries into the area and and our goods made here out so so transport is you know is is a huge area um i know our colleagues at the Tran uh, transport northeast team work tirelessly tires have worked and are working tirelessly to try and get additional funding in to you know improve all of those services we have seen over the past um couple also of fiscal announcements from government where there has been money allocated to, to the northeast um, but it hasn't yet arrived and, and I know we're lobbying very hard to get that within the region so it is it is fundamental and we see and obviously you know during the pandemic particularly on pu public transport where we've seen patronage drop um, clearly you know they, these are run by commercial businesses um, and, and you know it, it's very difficult to keep the level of services going um it, but but absolutely critical to get as, uh, particularly as we said in the pandemic to get those key workers into where they needed to be so that so there was a lot of work i think a lot of people um you know poss possibly watching today maybe not have, have appreciated going on behind the scenes to keep all of that particularly public transport running but it's not just about the current it's about really trying to improve those services going forward and as i mentioned earlier particularly 
about our rail system and um, linking with the rest of the UK. Thank you, Richard. I did say I'm going to bring you in, but actually, as time is slightly against us, I want to speak to Paul. It's kind of related to this um, about our track record in bringing in funding, government funding, uh, and other funding to the region. Um, how have we done? How can we do better? What are the sort of models of partnership that will really improve our position? I think partnership is critical, and with the combined authorities, we're working with them in terms of bringing funding in. The metro, obviously, the, the change in the carriages, the new carriages are critical, but we've got to look at other extensions to the rail system. For our own self, we've looked at our enterprise zones and we're funding activity in each of our ports. So significant activity in the port of Blythe, the port of Sunderland, the port of Tyne, Newcastle Airport, we're funding enterprise zones around those. So it's important to get the transportation of goods as well as people right in our area. So the LEPs, I think, did an awful lot to look at how we can improve the ports, the airports for that connective in goods and services and working with our partners in terms of other funding. Thank you. Alan, you wanting to come in? Yeah, just on that, you know, in my world, um, innovation funding, there's hugely competitive competitions at a national level. And, um, you know, we haven't always done well in those um, for a variety of reasons. I think some of them are structural down to our region. But um, I think the thing we need to work particularly on is, is finding public-private partnership models, particularly in innovation governments, looking for that. How can we unlock the private sector investment models in, into those, those public-private models? And that's a challenge for us. That doesn't come overnight. That comes with a lot of hard work and, and partnership. Helen. Yeah, and I suppose just, just to add in terms of, I suppose, going back to your question of how successful have we been in delivering and securing funding, I would say over the last 10 years, the North East LEP has secured either directly in grant funding or through um, co-investment from the private sector, over £3 billion for the North East. Um, but I think it's not just about what we've achieved to date, it's about what we can secure for the region going forward is absolutely fundamental. Thank you. Before I close, um, I just want to turn to, to Richard one more time. It's an AGM where customarily one looks at the, the past performance and so on. And we heard from Helen that we've uh, earlier that we've, we've done an, uh, an interim external evaluation of the strategic economic plan over the three years. In, in 20 seconds, Richard, there's a challenge. Can you just say what the key findings have been and, and what will we learn? Yeah, I mean, just the evaluation is really important, Lucy. We said in 2017 we were going to be visible in our performance and we were also going to use an evaluation to learn about how on an ongoing basis. So we're, we're doing two projects, an interim evaluation in real time, which is looking at uh, our performance in terms of the impact of some of the funds that we've, we've been talking about this morning. And the evaluators are, are saying that we're making very strong uh, impact in terms of the 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 um, impact of those those funds in terms of return on investment. Uh, the second area we're looking at is our our, our um, role as a sort of coordinating body and a leadership body, uh, and the evaluators are are also saying that we're doing well on that. They also comment on the performance on some of the numbers that Ellen was talking about earlier in terms of the SEP and the impact of the SEP, and clearly we were doing well, but COVID has has given us a bit of a, a hit, and we need to sort of keep keep going forward on that. Uh, and then the other thing that they're, they're doing in the project is, is recommending how we can move to a final evaluation of the SEP in 2024. So that's the next stage. We, we'll be publishing the interim evaluation in the next few months and then moving towards that final evaluation in 2024. Thank you. Let, let me just wander back to the podium just to, to bring things to an end. Um, almost on the dot of 10.30, and I'm sorry if it was a sort of whistle-stop to around um, a number of themes. Please keep in touch with us. Um, all of my colleagues here and I will be very happy to continue the discussion on these themes uh, and others. Um, a few thank yous. I do want to thank all of the panel um, for their contribution today, but not just today, over the last year, um, and others behind the scenes. I can see, but you can't. Um, uh, our lead on comms. Thank you for all the work that's done to help us here, and for our colleagues watching us at home for the hard work in 
a challenging year. Thank you very much. We couldn't do and achieve what we've heard about today without our partners, and, and you know who you are who've worked with us and support of us, supported us. Thank you. Uh, and finally, thank you very much to uh, everyone at home uh, or in your office who's joined us this morning. Um, please keep in touch. Thank you for our interest, uh, your interest in our work, and um, I hope that we'll see each other in person soon. Thank you.